Thanks for coming to Sunday School this morning. We're back. We're in Colossians 3. I know we've spent a handful of weeks in this chapter, but it's one of the... um, yeah, it's one of the more important chapters to understand our New Testament ethic, uh, how God calls us to live, and really the, the way in which we're to live. And we're calling that this morning um, Resurrection Ethics, and we want to look at kind of this, this indicative imperative pattern in Paul, because what we're doing, I'll pray here in a minute, is we're moving away from putting off all these things of the old Adam and the old age and our old nature now that we're new creatures in Christ. And, and Paul's calling us to put on uh, these different kind of attributes and characteristics and behavior that's fitting for us as Christians. And so we're going to look at that uh, really first from the indicative imperative pattern. And then we're just going to work through uh, verses 12 and following in the chapter. So let us pray and then we'll, be, we'll begin together. Father, we thank you for uh, our Savior, for his indestructible life, um, for the life-giving spirit that that you and and Christ have poured out on us. We thank you for your Holy Spirit uh, that has sealed us for the day of redemption, who is our advocate, who illumines our minds and hearts, uh, not just savingly to understand the gospel, but convicts us of sin, that we might draw ever nearer to you in repentance and faith. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you for our lives that are hidden in Christ with you. Help us to have a clearer sense of that this morning, uh, that we might live uh, differently and more and more imitate uh, God as Paul commands us to do. Uh, We thank you for the gospel, uh, for our forgiveness, for our reconciliation, and and your work of renewal uh, that you are doing in us even now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, we've been looking at, the, um, at our Christian ethics under, under really this uh, pattern of, you could call it reconciliation, reconciliation and renewal. And this is really, it's a really important pattern. Because oftentimes we can focus just on one or the other. Just our reconciliation in the gospel. Or we can be so focused on our renewal and our transformed life. And the fact is we need to be focused on both. And sometimes we can focus on the reconciliation in the gospel. And they realize, okay, that's in Christ. Lived, died, and rose. Through this mustard seed faith where I just turn away from myself. Perceived righteousness. Even the ugliness of my sin. And just cast myself on the Father's mercy toward me in the gospel. We're saved by Christ, but then we can think renewal is kind of left to our own task. That now that we have peace with God and access to God in prayer, now that now that we go love on our own strength, God basically says, Go, like you know, the training wheels are off the bike now. You're saved. Now go for it. And the claim that I'm making is that reconciliation and renewal are both in Christ. We don't ever want to move beyond Christ or think that we graduate beyond the gospel. So Paul opens with this resurrection ethic here. If you look in Colossians chapter 1, it's called the indicative imperative pattern. And so I want to read Colossians 1 and 2 because that's the context in which this command to put on love comes. It's this grand indicative that's been accomplished. In other words, indicatives are statements of fact about what God's done, or in light of what God's done, who you are in Christ. And then indicatives, sorry, imperatives are uh, commands about what you're to do. And so Paul has this resurrection ethic that's grounded in these grand indicatives of what God's done in Christ and who we are in Christ. Therefore, we're to live this way. And so it'd be like, If this is the case, you'll notice this in 1 and 2 there, verses 1 and 2 of Colossians chapter 3, then live this way. And so that's kind of the pattern of our resurrection ethics. So let's look at um, Colossians 3, 1 and 2, and then we've spent enough time on verses 5 through 11. We're going to pick up in verse 12. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. 
For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. So think about that. Did you notice the indicatives? Like, where do we see them? If then you have been raised with Christ, so that's almost like, uh, like you think of the patterns, is um, Paul's ethics. Since you have been raised with Christ, what are we to do? Seek the things that are above. That sounds like real spiritual, doesn't it? Oh, seek the things that are above. Like, you know, you've heard the statement, like, you can be so, uh, so heavenly minded that you're of no earthly good. Like, is that what he has in mind? Like, when he says, seek the things that are above, just seek, you know, the, the things above where Christ is. Like, what does that mean to seek the things that are above? Well, it means to seek Christ. And to seek Christ, the one who is the risen and exalted Savior. And is only risen because he has conquered sin and death and the grave. And so when you think of the Christian life, like it's one of, of resurrection life. So when you think of the ground of the reconciliation, of course, is going to be what? It's going to be the gospel. But the ground of the renewal is going to be um, our union with Christ. And he spent the previous chapter talking about how, you know, we were crucified with Christ. That he's given us new hearts. He turned our hearts of stone into what? Like a heart of flesh. We've been circumcised. In other words, like he regenerated our stony heart. You think of stony hearts. One of the most sobering verses in all of Scripture is Romans chapter 3, verse 10. It says, everyone's really sincere and just does in their heart what they want and God will accept them. No, it says no one seeks God. No, not one. All have turned aside. And you think, well, how how do we make sense of all the grand spiritualities and religions in the world? Like Luther would say that those are all um, attempts to attain the devil. In other words, the way of speculation, what's God like? Okay, I'll build this idol here. I'll worship in this way. I'll sacrifice, you know, children or, you know, bludgeon myself to be accepted. Speculation, bad, don't do that. The way of a mystical experience. I just want to have some mystical experience. Give me the, the, you know, this encounter with the divine. And then, of course, the common way is the way of morality. The way of ethical striving. I'll just try to be good enough for God to accept me. And those all seem like legitimate ways to seek God. And Paul's point is, Luther's point, the point in Romans is no one seeks God, no, not one. If anyone does any good, it's because they're living up in accordance with the image of God in which they were created. This constitution of a sense of right and wrong through God's law in the heart. I'm not saying people do terrible, heinous things, which they do. But not, we're not as bad as we could possibly be in our intensiveness. Sin corrupts us extensively in our reason, our will, our loves, our affections. And so when people are seeking God apart from how God has sought us in the gospel, it may look sincere. They may do you know, good works and beneficial works, and that's fine and well and good. But it's not finding God where he's found us in the gospel, which was crucified, buried, and raised for sinners in Christ. And so that's like the foundation of the reconciliation. And Paul has has spent a lot of time on that in Colossians. But now he's moving on to renewal. And you don't ever move beyond Christ, class. He wants you to be just grounded in Christ. And so he has this resurrection ethics. If you look in Colossians chapter 1, if then you've been raised with Christ... Now, it almost seems like a conditional statement. Really what he means is, since you've been raised in Christ, right? Since you've been raised with Christ. And you think of, when was I raised with Christ? So when you think of of union with Christ, there's this amazing um, decretal aspect to it. Like that God in Christ, Ephesians 1 says, chose you in Christ before the foundation of the world that you should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined you for adoption as sons. So there's this like eternal will of God, Father, Son, and Spirit, where God chooses you in Christ. From the fallen, corrupted mass of humanity, you think of God in the decrees, decrees to create, decrees willingly to permit the fall. doesn't cause evil, but willingly permits it. And then out of the fallen mass of humanity, this is eternity past, in a sense, these are just like logical uh, statements, not like temporal, like, oh, eternity past, there's no time, but just logically understanding what God's doing. Then he chooses in Christ from the fallen mass of humanity those who he is going to save. And so 
Anyone who's in Christ has gotten what? Mercy. Anyone who denies Christ or doesn't believe Christ or receives Christ gets what? Justice. Like, it's not that these are equivalent acts, that everyone's neutral, and then God says, okay, I'm choosing you for hell. It's, in other words, everyone deserves condemnation. They're already alienated in Adam because of guilt and really their own corruption once they're born. And then God chooses from that fallen mass of humanity who all deserve hell. I don't know how many He chooses, right? But everyone deserves hell. And He chooses some, who knows how many? He chooses some in Christ for eternal life and reconciliation. And He chooses them in Christ, the creedal. And then the federal aspect of your union with Christ. We're talking union with Christ here. Paul's focused on one aspect of our union. What I'm doing is try to lay the groundwork to show you that our experiential present reality, life hidden with Christ and God, being raised in Christ, even though we're here in North Hills, has this really rich basis in God's purposes for the salvation of His elect. The first of which is election in Christ, choosing you in Christ. And then, of course, the the basis on which God can show you mercy and grace is this federal union. When you think of how God comes to save sinners, how does He come? Clothed in the humanity of His incarnate Son, right? God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their, their trespasses against them. How does He come? In the weakness of flesh. Tired, sitting down on a well. Overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death in the garden. Sweating, as it were, great drops of blood. A crown of thorns, like hammered in thorns on his head. Soldier slapping him face. Prophesy who hit you. Like God comes in like the greatest weakness to save sinners in your flesh and blood because that's the kind of redemption that you need. One who is true man like you and yet not sinful like you. Faithful like you. And that's the one who's crucified on the cross in your place, like in your flesh. And so that's the federal union with Christ. There's a decretal chosen in Christ. The federal is obviously Christ in your flesh and blood, living, dying, and rising for you in the gospel. But Paul's emphasizing here, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. For you've died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. Okay, when did that happen? Well, not in eternity past because you didn't exist. In a sense, in the incarnate ministry of Christ, but it happened the moment that, what, that you believed. And so that's your experiential union with Christ. You think of um, the language in John chapter 14, and this has been like a key passage for us to return to. Jesus, Jesus talks about uh, God dwelling in us. You think it seems kind of like a weird passage, right? Look, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and the Father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. It's amazing, right? So does God really make his home in you? Wasn't he eternal and everywhere and and like omnipresent? So how is he omnipresent and then not making his home and then making his home in me, right? It almost seems like bad theology. If God's omniscient knowing all things and omnipresent everywhere, how is he not in everything, like the books and everything like that? Well, he, he's present with us in a new way. Through his incarnate son, the ministry or the spirit of his incarnate son. He pours out the Holy Spirit. If anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. And so it, God's present with us. The union with Christ happens, of course, the moment we believe, right? And then the spirit, of course, has regenerated our stony hearts. And God seals us with the spirit. And so what that does, of course, is unites us to Christ so that all his benefits become ours. And so Paul's resurrection ethic is is grounded, of course, you think of God's electing grace, God's uh, faithful gospel in the incarnate Son, but then the moment that your heart is regenerate and you you believe and and trust uh, God and the gospel of his Son for your salvation, you're united to Christ. It's called a mystical union because right now, look at, can you see Christ in any of our hearts? Absolutely not. And yet Paul says, you've been raised with Christ. And so when you, when you think about it, um, Paul has this interesting ethic. There's the indicatives. You've been raised with Christ. You have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. So what are you to do? Yeah. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. And, and his point is, like, seek that hidden, resurrected, empowered life that is only found in Christ. Does he mean 
be so heavenly minded that you're of no earthly good? No, because of course, seeking the things that are above will lead you to relate to the rest of creation and yourself in a proper way, right? That's a resurrection ethic. Any comments or questions before we look at some other examples of, of this indicative imperative ethic? Right? You've died, your life is hidden with Christ and God since. Therefore, seek the things that are above. You've died and your life, he says, what does he say? Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. And then he gives a, an aspect of hope here. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And so, in other words, is it easy to set your mind on things above? It depends on the day, doesn't it? But the earth is filled with beautiful, attractive, amazing things and filled with profane things that can capture our hearts. When you think of, um, I was reading some, some Aquinas, and the things that tend to capture us on earth, I'll talk, I'll, here it is. Okay. <laughs> things that are perceived as good. And things that are good, we have a love, a desire, a delight, or a hope. Or if we don't get it, if we don't get the things that are good, what can we have? A little bit of despair, right? So as it relates to things that are evil, things on the earth, we should, proper things, we should have a hatred, avoidance, or dislike, a sadness. When you see evil, does it make you happy or sad? should make you sad, right? What about when you see it in your own heart? Does that make you happy or sad or filled with excuses? <laughs> right? It depends, right? Not good, right? Let's own up to it. That's the amazing thing about the gospel. We can totally own it. Uh, daring, right? We can want to you know, jump in and rectify it. Uh, fear, anger. And so we have these amazing passions. You, you heard them. I read all of them. And the... the, the, the Crazy thing about that is that we can often misidentify or perceive the good and desire something that is not good or, or evil, but want to apprehend that as being a good. And so the thing about the good is that you have, um, you have kind of a, a desire for it, right? And then once you get it, you have a rest in it. That makes sense? You desire it, and once you attain it, you kind of rest in it. And the thing about when you mistake evil for good, we think of how we can be controlled by our passions. Love, desire, delight, hope, despair, fear, anger, sadness, avoidance, hatred. We have an affinity for what we like and aversion to what we don't like. And these things can, passions are good. But what we have to have is, is, is our mind renewed so that we know that heavenly good that God would have us delight in. And He, of course, is the ultimate good. God. We should orient our lives, direct our love toward Him, bask in Him, rest in Him, the One who has rescued us, the One who has reconciled us at great personal cost through the Gospel, the One who is at work to renew us after the image of His Son, and of course, how does that compare to your Instagram on your phone? Big deal, right? Let me see what's going on in the world. Big deal. Like, you know, where, where is your heart focused? Where is the, the mind or the eyes of your heart? Where are they attending? The greatest good, God, in His love and His grace and His mercy, it, it, the fact that you exist is your life is, in a sense, given. It's a gift. Like, you didn't... There's a great Psalm 100. It is He who made us and not we ourselves. <laughs> Don't you love that? Absolutely. It means that in a sense, God has made you. So who decides your ultimate purpose? God the Maker. Who is your Redeemer and your Savior. The One who is your Keeper. Who now, of course, in Christ is who? Your friend. Who loves you. Go ahead. This is a, kind of an immature question. But, um, okay. We want to do something or admire something or say something, um, and we're not sure whether it's good or not. Are there any criteria for this? That's a great question. Um, 
So Sylvia's question, when we desire something or want to do something or say something, how do we, how do we perceive or know whether it's good or not? Well, obviously, the, the commands of God, right? Is it an ex expression of loving God? What does that mean? Whatever I want it to mean. No, you know, having no other gods before you, right? Worshiping in the right way, not taking his name in vain, which means not just saying God when you stub your toe, but his name is his character, like trusting his character, trusting the ways that he reveals his name, Scripture. And then, of course, honoring the Lord's Day. And then as it relates to others, not murder, adultery, steal, like covet. But, of course, a new covenant, when you think of the, the new resurrection ethic, it's ratcheted up so much in the new covenant. First John says, uh, you know, a new commandment I give to you. But at the same time, it's an old commandment. But at the same time, it's a new commandment because the true light is shining and the darkness is passing away. And it's love one another. And you're like, that's not new, John. What, what's going on? Are you still exiled on Potmos? Have you not gotten any sleep? Love one another is like the, almost the second oldest commandment in the book after loving God, right? But at the same time, he says it's new because we're in a new period in redemptive history, which in a sense, we're, resur we're resurrected and united to Christ. And, and the command to love has been so ratcheted up that he says on the night when he's betrayed, he says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I've loved you. And that's not just refraining from stealing or coveting or adultery. It's a form of love that is, is, takes the form of service and sacrifice you know, you got to carry your cross and die to yourself. And often takes the form of suffering. Any of you who've tried to love people that way, how easy is that? It's impossible. In your flesh. That's why Paul says, you've died and your life is hidden in Christ with God. Because the reality is, the invisible missions of God, the incarnate Son, Christ in you, the hope of glory, and the Spirit who sealed you for the day of redemption, have made you a new creature and actually empower you to this form of love and good works as God's character and Christ's likeness is shaped in you. It's something that you just muster up on your own. It's only as, as you can continually live as you are. That would be Paul's ethic. Live as you are. But the, the ethic is not just live as you are. It's live in Christ as you are in Christ. So I'm going to get to your question. Seems like I'm like dodging it, Pastor. What are you afraid of the question, right? Let, let's look at a couple other texts that make this indicative imperative claim. Look, listen to this. Like, it seems like he's repeating himself. Listen to Ephesians 5.25. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, since you live in the Spirit, in, in other words, um, remember later in Galatians, it talks about if anyone's caught in sin, you who are spiritual should restore him. Like, you're spiritual. Like, you're not just like, Soul, everyone's spiritual, but, but by spiritual he means you who have the very, you know, in a sense, life of God, eternal life in Christ. You who are spiritual. Um, for freedom Christ Jesus has set us free. Do not be entangled again into a yoke of slavery. So he's basically saying, hey, if you live in the Spirit, live in the Spirit. <laughs> if Christ has set you free, live free. Do you catch his ethic? If, you're, if you've died and your life is hidden with Christ and God, live like it. Like his, his ethic is live in Christ as you are in Christ. So how do you know if something's good? Well, the commandments of God, but of course, how ratcheted up they are, the pattern of Christ, but then you also need a lot of wisdom. Like a perception to know what is the right thing to do, but then the right way to go about it. Because the world and at times we're filled with knowing the right thing to do, but we go about it in the wrong way. And sometimes you say you're on the horns of a dilemma, like almost, you know, how do you, how do you broach a situation? How do you do that? So I would say don't go against the commandments of God. Love God, love neighbor. Like the new covenant ethic, as we love one another, it should take the form of, which is often what, service, sacrifice, and suffering. It's not ironing everyone out. The good is that you need to hear this truth, right? <laughs> well, it depends how you say it. Um, ask a follow-up question though does that help at all or not really that's the criteria the revealed will of God and the commands but then also the new covenant ethic in Christ that's, that's the key way to know how to do good and, and, and certainly um, you need a lot of wisdom and wisdom happens you could say from your experience in the world 
your observation of it, which is an aspect of just your experience in the world, and then your reflection on what behavior is most fitting. And so that's like this, often you think old people are very wise, right? But you can have tons of these, I've been reading David Copperfield, and he's like an orphan, he goes through the ringer, you know, thick and thin, the guy's got so much wisdom, and he's a young man because of all his sufferings. He's taken advantage of by certain people, and so that, that gives him a certain perspective on how to discern like evil and relate to people like wisely, keep distance from other people, engage other people. So a lot of wisdom is very important, but wisdom must apprehend the good, the penultimate good of God, and then view all things in light of that. View all things in light of uh, creation and its givenness, God's reconciling work in Christ, and then God's renewing work. Because even though all the commandments are the same for every one of us, Every one of us here expresses Christ's likeness in different degrees, in different ways according to our gifts and our abilities and our character and our history. And so it's not a matter of just saying, hey, get this through your head. You know, I, I got a package yesterday and I opened it and I left the package out. And my wife's like, hey, uh, did you leave this out? Of course, like... The kids didn't open it, right? So of course I left it out. Like, what's the matter with me, right? Why, why am I leaving packages out again? Like, why, why do I just, you know, open the book and want to start reading the book and not put the package away and leave the scissors out? Like a bunch of kids running around the house. Like, it's a terrible thing. So, of course I'm sorry I left the package out, right? It's, have mercy on me. <laughs> like, you know, was she going to go, like, to DEFCOM 9 because I left the package out? She could have because it happens. That's like the fifth time she's probably had to tell me that in the last month. But a matter of wisdom was just, you know, finding out if I did it and then asking me if I wanted to put it away or she wanted to put it away, <laughs> which I totally respected, right? You take care of it, honey. I'm going to read this book. You know? <laughs> just give me the scissors. <laughs> so you just need a lot of wisdom based on who you're dealing with. And what, what is it you're trying to accomplish? Do I never ever want to put a package away again? Am I going to ratchet it up? Or am I going to try to be loving and remind him? Or am I just going to put it away and not say anything? Like she had a bunch of decisions. I thought she handled it probably better than I would have. Are your shoes there? You know, all, the, all these things. Like what's the wisest way to love somebody? Those seem very trivial. But the reality is, you, you know, you have to put yourself in someone else's shoes to a degree. Um, what, what else? Do you, I guess the point is we're defined by the age to come with the resurrection ethic. And that age to come has been inaugurated through Christ's life, death, and resurrection. And the age to come is a reality in your life the moment that you believe the Spirit unites you to the risen and exalted Christ. That your life is no longer characterized by sin, condemnation, alienation, and death. It's characterized by forgiveness, justification, reconciliation, and life. Did you catch those categories? Those are like these amazing binaries. We still do sin. We may feel condemned. We may feel like we're not reconciled. We may feel dead. Those are not the, the truest things about you. It's forgiveness, justification, reconciliation, and life in God. That's what it means to be raised with Christ. And that's the reality of the resurrection ethic is those things as you sit there, no matter the week you've had, life, Justification, reconciliation, and renewal are, are the ultimate realities of your life. And that's so beautiful. So that's why Paul has, opens the way he does. And then look what he moves on to, because we spent so much time covering verses 5 through 11. In verse 12, look, look what he does again. He's going to lead with these indicatives before he tells us what to do. He says, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, Kindness, hum can someone grab those doors? I'm sorry. Um, humility, meekness, and patience. Bearing with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And so you notice what he does in verse 12. Did you catch those indicatives? Put on then as God's chosen ones. So in other words, what's your identity? Chosen. Beloved. Beloved. Go ahead. Beloved. 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 Yeah, remember um, the transfiguration? What a beautiful scene. Like, um, 
Jesus is up on the mountain. He takes Peter, James, and John with him. And he starts getting transfigured. And like, you know, Moses, Old Testament law, and Elijah, the prophet, are talking to him. Peter's like, hey, this is great. Let's build three tabernacles. You know, one for you, Jesus. One for, like, putting Christ on equal standing with these two. And God, like, the, the glory cloud comes and says, this is my beloved son, like, with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Like, in other words, Peter stopped trying to do... And then the disciples, they're overcome with fear, right? And what does Christ do? It's, it's, one, it's actually so beautiful. Look at what Christ does. I think it's... Uh, I better know where it is. L- listen to what he does. <clears throat> but Jesus came. So when the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces. They're terrified. Notice how Christ comes to them. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise, have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Notice how he comforts them. He comforts them in two ways. Number one, with his word, right? Rise, have no fear. And then number two, with his touch. Like he touches them. Like what a great scene. And that that goes back to being a beloved son or beloved child of God. Like in a sense, God has reached near to touch you, not just in the incarnation, but experientially, even now by a spirit who is a comforter and an advocate that you might find consolation and renewal. And and God is, of course, the psalmist says, is the lifter of our heads. I love to look at that passage. They're terrified. He gives a word and then He touches. It's so beautiful how how He cares for them. Um, Holy. We talked about that a little bit last week. But let's let's talk about um, compassionate hearts. Kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. What's the opposite of those? Like when you think of it, is opposite of those things to manifest yourself, manifest themselves in your life? Are you harsh? Are you prideful? Are you impatient? Are you just seeking justice? And sure, of course, it's within your right to do that because they deserve that, because they should know better. But of course, that, that resurrection ethic, like when you think of um, a compassionate heart is a heart that that doesn't just exact justice in the face of wrongs toward one another. This is written to the church. Get your justice in the world. Be wise. Be humble. Shine like stars. Okay, But this is, this is a, a Christian new creation ethic in the church. Like, Be compassionate. Don't just exact justice all the time. Show mercy. And mercy is... is um, not treating others as their sins deserve. And how does that compassionate heart get formed in you? It's the life of Christ. It says you, of course, imitate God, and yet you're not imitating God in your own strength and power. It's God's life is being formed in and through you by the Spirit. That Christ's characteristics shine forth more and more by His grace. As you learn of him, as you know the truth, Titus says in um, chapter 1, that, that the truth accords with what? Godliness. Or that godliness is in accordance with truth. And so when you look at the, the, his command, uh, humility, meekness, and, and patience, bearing with one another, And if anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. Like, in a sense, what he's showing you is is what it takes to bear with one another in a way that, that is loving. And the primary way is to that you forgive. Like, all those all those things, how do you forgive easily? So how hard is it to forgive? It depends what they've done, right? Depends the effects of the sin that they've done. Hard to forgive sometimes. Um, It's easy to forgive if you're compassionate, if you're meek, if you're humble, and if you're patient. Much easier to forgive than if you're prideful, justice exacting, um, haughty, and impatient. 
And so he's teaching you to bear with one another. The form of your bearing with one another is going to be forgiving one another. And you think of um, those, the couple scenes in, in Luke's Gospel. Um, <laughs> remember, the, the king has a servant who owes him like 10,000 talents. Okay, a talent is 20 years wages, right? So I don't know how, I'm not good with math. It's like 200,000 years. I don't know how many years that is. It's a long time, right? And, and the king orders this guy and his family to be thrown in the slammer until he can repay. And the guy says, have mercy on me. So the king cancels the debt. And then that servant who is forgiven finds someone who owes him maybe like 100 denarii, which is three to four months wages. And he starts shaking him down. Pay me what you owe, right? <laughs> Pay me what you owe. Are you like that? Pay me what you owe. Are you unforgiving? Pay me what you owe. And then uh, the other servants see this, and of course, hey, they probably owe this guy a couple denarii too. So they go and run to the king, and they're like, man, he's shaking him down. Like, this is not right. And he says, grabs him, hey, throw him in the slammer until he's paid the last penny. Terrible situation, right? And he says, basically, why did he shake the guy down? It's kind of a, a difficult. Did he not really think he was forgiven? I think he's, he's trying to like shake the guy down so he can pay the king back, in a sense. He can't really rest on the forgiveness. He wants to bring a little something to the table. And like you will be unforgiving if you think you bring this, that, and the other thing to the table that reconciles you to God. Here's what you bring to the table. Sin, sin, sin. That's all you bring to the table. Sin. You might as well just give it to God. And you know other people sin against you? Boom. Ow, that hurts. Ooh. Forgive one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Like, that's the pattern. Um, there's also this other, this other, Jesus goes into, uh, this, this Pharisee has him over. His name's Simon. Has him over for dinner near the end of his ministry. And um, they're all eating around the table. And this, like, uh, this wild woman, this woman of the city, woman of the night, kind of comes in. You know, of course, she's a sinner. And she's, she's just, like, anointing his feet, and they're like, man, if this guy was a prophet, he wouldn't know what kind of woman that is. And, and Jesus says, Simon, hey, when I came over, did you wash my feet? You show me any hospitality? Did you do this, that, and that thing? He says, I'll tell you what, you know, this woman loves much because she was forgiven much. And if you're forgiven little, you're going to love little. And so the way that you're going to forgive much or be meek and humble and compassionate is if you know yourself truly, as a great, great, terrible sinner that deserves the wrath and condemnation of God. And yet one who has received life and forgiveness and reconciliation and renewal in Christ. Like that will put the posture and your disposition of the soul. You may not be quick to forgive like all the time, but you will say, man, I must forgive this other person as God in Christ has forgiven me. And Knowing my words and then hearing that and being a little convicted this morning at 10.36 isn't going to help you do it. Cry out to God. Lord, help me to be forgiving. I love to exact justice. My spouse, this person, that person. Like the, 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 um, my old Pentecostal pastor used to say, hurt people hurt people. <laughs> And when you're carrying around unforgiveness and the bitterness that goes along with that, what are you going to be filled with? Exacting justice, vitriol, pain. Like it's going to come out. One second. And so just, you have this union with Christ, but you know, prayer and communion is, is one of the chief ways God brings about that renewal. Certainly worship. That's why He's instituted the Lord's Supper. You know, I'm like, sometimes, honey, please forgive me. You know, now I'm serving the supper. i got to hustle back to the pew and please forgive me you know, before we partake sometimes. Like, that's why he's instituted it, that we might like, be forgiven. And it's not just a picture of our unity, the Lord's Supper. It's actually the meal that creates the unity. As we commune with God in Christ by the Spirit, like, there is a greater unity there. Um, any comments or questions before we move on? Yeah, go ahead. What's that mean to be a 007 style Christian? Well, you see a couple of the films and read the book, you know, it's like, I'm going to get even with this sucker. 
<laughs> shake and not stir. You're going to shake people down? You're going to shake people down? Like, yes. Lord, help me not to shake people down. It is so natural in us to shake people down. Don't, like, the only way you can forgive one another is God in Christ has forgiven you. And, and he says, look in verse 14, and above all these, put on love which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you are called in one body. And be thankful. Like obviously, we put on love. Um, we're able to put on love because God has shed abroad His love in our hearts through the Spirit whom He's given us. Like we don't put on love somehow divorced from the Trinity. <laughs> We put on love because of God and Christ put on our flesh, lived, died, and rose for us. We're able to put on love because love is, is one of the preeminent, the preeminent fruit of the Spirit, love. We put on love, you think of the Spirit being the bond of love. You think of a lover and a beloved, right? Lover and a beloved. You who are married, there's this bond of love between the two of you. We can't see it's not like tangible, but it's there. Lover and beloved. And so, like historically, the Trinity was understood as, as a lover, Eternal Father, in His love, begets His own self-knowledge eternally. An eternally begotten Son who is the very knowledge of God's self. And then this bond of love, lover, father, beloved, son, beloved, son with whom I am well pleased, there's a bond of love between the two, which is the eternally preceding Holy Spirit. And so, of course, when you think of, um, well, how does God allow us to put on love? Well, that's the, that's the created effect. This love in your soul is the created effect of the life of God and the Spirit of God within you. That's the way you put on love. God empowers it. God enables it. God commands it. And what love does is it binds everything together in perfect harmony. Um, well, I think we're just about done. We're going to sing the song once more at the end, ladies. Is that okay? Yeah, we'll sing 521 here in a minute. Is there any comments or questions before we close, though? We'll, we'll pick up there in verse, um, verse 15 next week. Well, let us, let us close in prayer. Um, Father, we thank you that uh, these aren't mere commands and imperatives that spring from Paul's pen, but these commands and imperatives come to us um, who have been reconciled to you and who are being renewed uh, in the image of, of our Savior in Christ's likeness. So Lord, help us this week to, to put off um, covetousness, which is idolatry, and, and to put on love as you do love us, as you will keep us, um, as you long for us to be compassionate and kind and humble and meek and patient. Oh, Father, form uh, those beautiful characteristics in greater measure in our lives that we might live beautiful lives for your glory and for the good of others. And receive our praise even now as we sing to you. In Jesus' name, amen.